Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and I want to talk about some new studies about aspirin and omega-3 fatty acids. The ARRIVE trial began over 10 years ago to determine whether or not taking aspirin for primary prevention was protective. Primary prevention means you haven't had an event like a heart attack or stroke or anything like that yet. The study was randomized, placebo controlled and blinded and include 12,546 subjects who were followed for 60 months. All subjects were non-diabetics and they had moderate risk factors for cardiovascular disease. The study showed that taking 100 milligrams of aspirin daily did not reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. The incidence of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, unstable angina, stroke or transient ischemic attack was 4.3% in the aspirin group and 4.5% in the placebo group, not statistically significant. On the other hand, there were a lot more bleeding episodes and hemorrhagic strokes in the aspirin group than the placebo group. In other words, the risks of taking aspirin were shown to outweigh the benefits for primary prevention. And in the case of one of the events being hemorrhagic stroke, I mean, people take aspirin to prevent cardiovascular events, right? So in some respects, it causes the things you're trying to prevent from happening. Now, this is very important because aspirin is widely prescribed for primary prevention. One national survey showed that just over half of adults between the ages of 45 and 75 take aspirin daily and 21% had used it sometime in the recent past. The study showed that about 81% of those taking the drug were taking it for primary prevention, 84% to prevent heart attack, and 66% of them to prevent stroke. The FDA recommends specifically against aspirin for primary prevention since data shows that when taken for this purpose, for each prevent event that you prevent, one major bleeding event takes place. So you help one, you hurt one. Not really so good. Thus, the FDA states that doctors should recommend aspirin only to patients who have had a heart attack or stroke. But doctors are not following these recommendations. In the study cited above, most of the people were taking aspirin on, and they were recommended to do so by their doctor. Another study, the ASCEND trial, looked at the effect of aspirin versus placebo and also omega-3 fatty acids versus placebo for 15,480 diabetic adults. Additionally, the study looked at whether or not taking aspirin reduced the risk of cancer since it's often represented to be effective for that purpose. Diabetics, by the way, have a threefold higher risk of dying from coronary artery disease than non-diabetics and are also at higher risk of dying of cancer. Overall, no clear benefit was shown from taking a daily aspirin in this trial. A small reduction in serious vascular events for patients taking aspirin was offset by an almost equal number of major bleeding events, such as bleeding in the head or brain from the gut and elsewhere, which was serious enough to require hospitalization. Other side effects included first serious vascular events like non-fatal heart attacks, non-fatal strokes or mini strokes, and death from cardiovascular causes. In other words, aspirin caused some of the events it was supposed to prevent in this trial as well as in the other one. As far as cancer is concerned, while some studies have suggested that aspirin could reduce the risk of gastrointestinal cancers, there was no reduction in cancer risk from taking aspirin reported in this study. Taking omega-3 fatty acids was proven to be useless as well. Patients received either one gram of fish oil or placebo with the amount selected based on earlier studies which had shown some promise. Omega-3 supplementation did not reduce the risk of vascular events like myocardial infarction, non-hemorrhagic stroke, transient ischemic attack, or, heart or cardiovascular death. Lead researcher Dr. Louise Bowman said, quote, on the basis of these results, I believe that there is no justification for using a one gram dose of omega-3 fatty acids for the prevention of cardiovascular disease and that current guidelines should be re uh, reconsidered. She also noted that in spite of this, the global market for these supplements is $31 billion. Even though the supplements are useless, they remain one of the most commonly prescribed with one survey showing that 84% of the time they're recommended for the purpose of improving heart health by who? healthcare providers. These studies show the huge disconnect between what the evidence shows and what advice patients are given by doctors and their other healthcare providers. Taking aspirin and omega-3 fatty acid supplements is a waste of money for most people. And the other problem is it provides just a huge distraction from the things that would really make a big difference, which is changing your diet and lifestyle habits. And of course, I'm blaming doctors here for this, but there's another part of this um, that involves advertising. And I'm sure you've seen those ads on TV where people like Bob Harper who've had a heart attack, or sometimes it's somebody you never know who's telling their story about 
how they were so terrified one night and went to the hospital and they had a heart attack and then their doctor put them on an aspirin regimen. So ask your doctor about taking aspirin. So the aspirin companies are ginning up the public to go ask for aspirin. And then doctors who don't read this kind of stuff are more than happy to say, yeah, you probably should take it. It's good for people your age. Actually, it's not good for most people. Um, and I'll cover secondary prevention in a different uh, format, but because uh, I just these are new studies and I, I got some emails about them, so I wanted to cover this today. Um, but the effect for secondary prevention is not as much as you might imagine. So I guess the theme of today's broadcast is drugs. So let's talk about drugging children. That's always a good idea, right? Almost 20% of American children take at least one prescription drug, and one out of 10 children take two or more, or more. That's really disturbing. According to a new study, one in 12 kids taking more than one drug is at risk of a serious drug-drug interaction, or DDI. According to lead author Demon Cato at the College of Pharmacy at the University of Illinois, quote, currently adverse drug events are the leading cause of injuries and death among children and adolescents. This means that the leading cause of, of, of death in children and adolescents is medical care. Okay? Now, invariably, I'm sure some of these kids need to take drugs, but I'm pretty sure a lot of them don't, and I'll tell you why in a second. Researchers analyzed data for 23,179 children and adolescents and reported that medication in use increased with age. In other words, the older the kids got, the more of them were taking drugs, and the more of them were taking more than one drug. The most commonly prescribed drugs were those used to treat asthma and psychiatric drugs, including stimulants and antidepressants. Not surprisingly, the most common drug-drug interactions involved the use of antidepressants. The most common result of interactions was QT prolongation, which is a heart rhythm condition that can cause faster chaotic heartbeats. Potential effects can include fainting, seizures, and even sudden death if the heart beats erratically for too long. This is a major issue because prolongation is often asymptomatic and can develop very, very quickly into a serious condition. The highest risk group was female adolescents with 20% risk for a DDI. The researchers wrote that adolescent girls have a three-fold higher risk than adolescent boys due to the fact that more girls take tricyclic, tricyclic antidepressants in combination with antibiotics, antiemetics, NSAIDs, and proton pump inhibitors. So we're treating kids for pain and reflux and I, along with antidepressants. They also wrote that medications that increase the risk of suicide are often prescribed in combination to both children and adolescents. The researchers reported that over half of adolescent girls taking an antidepressant, which is known to increase the risk of suicidal ideation, take at least two additional psych drugs or hormonal contraceptives. They added that, quote, healthcare professionals, including psychiatrists, may not be fully aware of the suicidal risks associated with the concurrent use of prescription medications and the evaluation and treatment of depressive symptoms in younger patients. Well, I think they should be aware. You would think that they'd want to be aware if they're prescribing these drugs to kids. There are many studies showing that there are serious potential side effects from many drugs commonly prescribed to kids, even when they're prescribed alone. For example, a recent meta-analysis showed that hallucinations and psychotic symptoms are side effects of methylphenidate prescribed for the treatment of ADHD in between 1 and 2.5% 2 and of children and adolescents who take them. According to the Centers for Disease Control, 6.1 million children in the United States were diagnosed with ADHD in 2016. If just 70% of those 75 percent of those children are medicated, this means that we can expect as many as 114,375 children to have hallucinations and psychotic symptoms. But according to lead author Erica Ramstead, MD, Concern, this is a quote, concerns about this rare possible adverse event should of course be balanced against the potential benefits of methylphenidate on ADHD symptoms, general behavior, and quality of life. By the way, she's wrong about that. The National Institute of Mental Health has determined that there is no measurement of ADHD drugs in which children get better by taking them. Anyway, based on the numbers, however, the side effect doesn't seem to be so rare. I mean, 114,375 children just doesn't sound so rare to me. Call me crazy, right? And frankly, her cavalier attitude is a little bit disturbing. But she's not the only one who just thinks there's no problem with this. Russell Barkley, a clinical professor of psychiatry, also says we shouldn't be concerned about this type of side effect in children. He states that most children don't have these effects, and then he says, quote, 
The reaction is temporary, lasting only during the time course of the last dose, and no cases are known to have been permanently so affected. So a child having hallucinations and psychosis for a little while, no problem, right? Dr. Dr. Barclay is a little scary person as far as I'm concerned. He goes on to say that, quote, when such adverse reactions occur, treatment with antipsychotic drugs such as halperidol may be useful to hasten the recovery from the adverse event. So you just give them an antipsychotic. What the heck? No problem, right? His solution is more drugs to counter the awful side effects of the drugs that have been proven to have no positive long-term effect on outcomes for children. It just defies logic, in my opinion. You know, there are many excellent and responsible practicing doctors, but the medical profession as a whole just seems to have lost its ethical and moral compass. Parents now have to worry about protecting their children from another form of harm, from medical care. And isn't that sad? All right, well, that's all for today, and in fact, all for the week. So please pass this on to anybody else who you think might enjoy watching it. Hit that subscribe button. We're going for 25,000 subscribers, and then we're going to have a drawing for a $200 gift certificate. And then we're going to keep going with benchmarks um, throughout the uh, year as we add to our subscriber base. So thanks so much for watching, and I'll be back to you next Tuesday with more news.